All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. To Martha, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Before we open God's word together this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we're thankful so much for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It is the word that you breathed out to be recorded, to be uh, preserved down through history that we might know you, that we might understand what the problem is between human beings, between us and you, between the fact that we are originally created in your image and likeness, and yet that has been corrupted because of sin, but you loved us in such a way that you gave your only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins. And now, Father, as we continue our study of the details surrounding his death on the cross, his betrayal and arrest, we pray that we might be Uh, strengthened and encouraged knowing that this is all according to your plan and every detail that took place was known by you in fact many of these were prophesied in the Old Testament and that fulfillment of prophecy is just another way in which our um, confidence in your word is is strengthened and that it provides more and more evidence of the truth of your word and the reality of what took place on the cross and we pray this in Christ's name Amen. Open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 26, verse 47. Matthew 26, 47, the parallel passages that we're looking at are in Mark 14, 43 to 52, Luke 22, 47 to 53, John 18, 2 through 11. If you remember from last week when I introduced this section, I talked about the focal point last week, which was on Judas as the betrayer and on his betrayal of the Lord that took place in the Garden of Eden and its significance. I started off talking about the meaning of these words, treason or betrayal, that this is when someone goes against the authority that is set over them and uh, betrays them or fights against them or disobeys them in some serious way. I gave several historical examples, one of which was of Guy Fawkes, who was a, a Brit who in the uh, 1600s was part of a plot to blow up Parliament. Well, today is Guy Fawkes Day, so I just had to remind you of that. And they celebrate that by shooting off a lot of firecrackers and things of that nature. But when we look at things of that nature, where we see someone who is diso- not only disobedient to a legitimate authority established over them, but seeks to overturn that and to pervert that, it raises questions related to when is it, if ever, justified to defend yourself against a government, to fight against perceived tyranny, or to even defend your life against a government power. We will touch on part of that today. The details of that are really covered in studies that I've done on Romans 13, and in 1 uh, 1 Peter 2.13, which you can study. But in this episode, we're going to see that Jesus is being attacked illegally. Both the Romans and the Jewish authorities are violating their own laws in the way they are arresting Jesus. And so Jesus, in one sense, has every right to self-defense. He has every right to Uh, resist the authority of Rome and the illegal actions of the Jewish authorities, yet Jesus chooses 
not to exercise that right and privilege that he has, not only as an individual Jew, but as the Son of God, as the Sovereign of the universe. I want to remind you of a passage in Philippians. In this section of Philippians, Paul is talking about humility. What is genuine humility? And he is <coughs> challenging the people in the congregation at Philippi to model their thinking after the thinking of Jesus, which, it gen which shows genuine humility and submission to authority. It's always interesting when you go through Scripture that when m many things are, are given as a challenge or instruction to believers, that those Scriptures do not go to some historical figure or to some cultural icon. They don't illustrate with stories of the day. They go to Jesus. They go to God. They go to historical examples from the Old Testament because we're supposed to understand the Bible and be familiar with it. This is God's Word. This is the divine interpretation of events. And so we don't go to pop culture and we don't go to these other things to develop these illustrations. We go to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords himself, who Paul says in Philippians 2 6 existed in the form of God. That means he existed in, with the very essence of God. He was undiminished deity. But he did not regard that equality with God, which would mean his authority, his, the fact that he is uh, fully God, that he is the creator, as we studied last time, and that he has uh, a right to expect obedience from his creatures. He didn't regard that equality with God as something to be grasped or held onto, but he emptied himself, not a good, time, good term really, it has the idea that he added to himself the form of a bondservant, that is, uh, he was made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he, this is the key phrase, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death. Not just obedient to the Father, but obedient to these unjust authorities that he that was going to sentence him to death on the cross it's a great example now he didn't he's not saying that you always have to do that but there may be times and situations where that is the appropriate choice just because we have rights doesn't mean we should always assert those rights and privileges it is up to the individual. So last time, as we started through this passage, I pointed out three things that we covered last time. The arrival of the crowd in Matthew 26, 45 to 47. The backdrop, going back to the early part of Matthew 26, where we learned of the conspiracy by the members of the Sanhedrin, which was totally illegal, to arrest Jesus and to kill Jesus. And then third what happened when Judas arrived and his kiss of betrayal. This morning, we're going to look at three more things in this passage. First of all, the authority of the Son of God, which is not mentioned in the synoptic accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but it is described in detail by John in John 18, 4 through 7. Then, we're going to look at Peter's emotional reaction to the men coming to arrest Jesus. And this, in fact, is covered in each of the gospel accounts. There are not always things that are covered in all four gospel accounts. So when some event is covered in all four gospel accounts, that is of great significance. And then six. At the end, Jesus emphasizes why it is important that these things take place so that Scripture will be fulfilled, prophecy will be fulfilled. And this is mentioned in Matthew 26, not by the other two synoptic writers, and then it's mentioned in John 18, 9, and you should read that along with John 17, 12, which we'll look at as we go forward. 
So just to review a little bit, last time we looked at the arrival of the crowd. Matthew 26, 47 says, And while he was still speaking, that is to his disciples at the conclusion of his three times of prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, Behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. When the accounts are compared with Mark and Luke, we know that all of the different religious groups were behind this and participated in this, and that is an indictment on them because this is very much an illegal action that is taking place, that uh, it's happening at night, it's happening uh, in violation of the laws that were later recorded in the Mishnah, it's happening uh, by the religious leaders who are later to sit in judgment. And so it shows that they are not objective whatsoever, violating uh, another law as well. Religious authorities were prohibited from arresting anyone as a result of a bribe as well. That's a, another law that was broken. And so they are arresting Jesus as the result of bribing uh, Judas to betray him. We're told that this crowd that came is a cohort. The English translated a detachment of troops. The Greek word is spira, which refers to a cohort. Some people try to reduce it to something much, much smaller. I ran across a very good uh, quote in Raymond Brown. Raymond Brown is a Roman Catholic scholar who's written a a <clears throat> two-volume work just on the death of the Messiah that is uh, extremely granular. He says, it's very good on history and background and customs, by the way. The theology is questionable at places, but it's got good background information. He says, although there are instances of this Greek word spira, rendering the Latin word manipulus, which refers to 200 troops, it's the normal word, though, for the Roman cohort. In other words, what he's saying is sometimes it translates manipulus, but normally it relates to the cohort, which, as I said last week, is one-tenth of a legion, 600 troops. That John means the latter, that is, 600 troops, is suggested by the title Kiliarchos, okay, by, uh, given to the commander in 1812. Uh, the normal Greek rendering of the word of the Latin tribunus militum, who was the ruler, or I'm mean, excuse me, the commander over a cohort, and then he says parenthetically, he says those who reduce the cohort to simply a manipulus of 200 men have to reduce him, the le that is the commander, to a decurio, which is a type of a corporal. In other words, he's making a good point, and several people have commented since last time, that they had no idea how many, how many people had come out to the Garden of Gethsemane. If you've been there, you know this area is not necessarily that large. And here you have a, a minimum of 600 troops, plus you have the temple uh, police, and you have all of the representatives of these religious groups. So you have somewhere between 600 and 1,000 coming to arrest, uh, arrest Jesus. And what's interesting is in the verses, it talks about the fact that they came with lamps and torches and lights and all of this, that in the midst of what would be a dark night, there was some light from a full moon, because remember, it's Passover, so that's a full moon, so it wasn't completely dark, could have been clouded. But the irony here that we might miss is that they have to light their way to arrest the light of the world. Last time I mentioned that Judas was demon, is Satan possessed. Satan is described in 2 Corinthians as one who, de, who uh, disguises himself as the angel of light. So the angel of light is also coming to betray the light of the world. So it's these little subtleties in the text that are important to bring out as we uh, continue our study. We saw the backdrop in relationship to the conspiracy that at the beginning of the week, the chief priests and the scribes and elders conspired with Caiaphas, the high priest, in order to take Jesus by trickery and to kill him. They are enabled in this by Judas, who we learn from Luke 22.3 is 
indwelt by Satan. And this occurred at the time early in the week when he first contacted the uh, chief priests and the elders. And then it happened again. We saw that Satan entered into him uh, during the uh, Seder meal, during the Passover meal, the night before Jesus went to the cross, that in John 13, this is described that Satan enters into him. So he is Satan possessed. And he is, as he goes to betray the Lord and to give him the kiss of betrayal described in Matthew and in Mark. And we went through that passage, and what I wanted to bring out was that this kiss is described by the word used by Matthew and Mark is a word that indicates uh, passion. It indicates the, the same level of passion. It's the same word that's used of, uh, of Mary, the sister of Martha, who is the one who anoints Jesus' feet and, and wipes with his, her tears and wipes them dry. And this shows that there's something going on here that is private, that as the as Judas has led, as it's described in the Gospels, he's led the troops out there, so he's in the front, that he probably separates himself, that's what it indicates, and, he, and Jesus is in front of the disciples, and they have this meeting. And it's not just a meeting between Jesus and Judas, it's a meeting between the Son of Man, the eternal Son of God, and Satan, the leader of the cosmic rebellion against God, and he feigns this loyalty through this kiss, and Jesus somewhat sarcastically asks him this question. And it's, I would paraphrase it this way, do you really think you're betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Jesus asserts by this that he is still in control. He is completely in control of everything that is taking place, and he's the one who is submitting to their authority. And as we'll learn in a few moments, he could call on, the, uh, on a myriad of angels that would come down and defend and rescue him. But instead, he is submitting to this because this is God's plan and purpose for uh, redemption. Now the last thing he, I want to point out from this, which I didn't touch on last time, is when Judas approached Jesus, Jesus says to him in Matthew 26, 50, friend, why have you come? Now most of the time that we see Jesus use the word friend, it is a form of the noun philos, which is from the Greek uh, phileo, which indicates a close, personal, intimate love or affection and is the word for a personal friend. That's not the word that Jesus uses here for Judas. He uses the word hetairos, which could be translated as comrade. That sounds a little too communistic. Uh, comrade or companion, it's the word that would be used of, a, of an impersonal relationship with an associate, usually someone who's inferior like an employee or a, or a pupil. It does not imply a personal friendship, sort of like your Facebook friends. You have no idea who most of those Facebook friends are. There's no relationship there. They're just somebody you said you would friend so that they could see the wise things or pictures that you post on Facebook. That's what this is. It's, it, it's, it's not an insult. It's not positive. It's just sort of a, a neutral word there, but it doesn't imply any kind of close personal friendship. It's interesting that in John 15, after Jesus had sent Judas away, in John 15, as they're going to the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas is gone. Jesus says to the other 11, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, philos. So there's an important distinction the scriptures make here between Judas. He is not a believer. He is not really a friend of Jesus. He is out for his own. He is a thief, as described in scripture. 
Now, the first thing we want to look at today is what's described in John chapter 18. John chapter 18 gives us a different look at what is going on here, according to John's gospel. And this, <coughs> in verses 4 through 7, we see a different aspect of the encounter. It is not the same as what we have in the synoptics. There, it emphasizes Judas coming out and uh, having the kiss of betrayal. But here, I think this happens afterward, that after that intimate conversation between Jesus and Judas, then Judas goes back as to the crowd as Jesus approaches them. And we read in verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him. Because he is the Son of God, he's undiminished deity, and he's omniscient, he knew everything that was going to transpire. He is fully aware of what's happening so that when he submits to this unjust authority, he knows exactly what that will entail. He know, knew all things that would come upon him. He goes forward. He's taking the initiative. He's showing he is in control. He's not a victim. He's in control. And he asked them, whom are you seeking? They answered him, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And then Jesus answers, and in the English it translates it, I am he, and the he is usually italicized because it's not in the original. It's a phrase in the Greek that is the understood translation of the personal name of God from the Hebrew. He says, I am. There are seven key phrases in the Gospel of John where Jesus uses this, and the implication is that he is saying something that identifies himself as the Messiah and as the Son of God. And so he just answers with the name of God, I am. And we're told Judas was there with him. And when he says this, they drew back and fell to the ground. They hear the voice of God, not the voice of the humanity of Jesus. He speaks with such power and authority. I, I would love to have had an MP3 recorder there so that we could record that. I think MP3 is becoming an old protocol now we have to find out what the new one is but you know the idea we got to have a voice recorder and to hear what that it reverberated from the hills it echoed down the Kidron Valley the 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 crowd of a thousand were knocked down by his voice so s several minutes are going to go by they have to pick themselves up from the ground, dust themselves off, wonder what in the world just happened. And then as they're collecting themselves, Jesus asks them a second time, whom are you seeking? Again, they say Jesus of Nazareth. And in verse 8, we read him answering. He says, I've told you that I am he. Now, the reason I put he in here, it's italicized again. He says, ego and me again, but he doesn't say it with the divine voice of authority he did the first time. So this is in a more of his normal voice. And he goes on to say, therefore, if you seek me, let these go away. So he is releasing his disciples at that point because he, he can read their minds. He knows exactly what they're thinking, and they're thinking that they want to be anywhere else but here getting arrested by Roman soldiers and the Jewish authorities. And we will be told that that's what happens is that they leave. And so what we have here is this unjust authority that is arresting the creator of the universe the second person of the Trinity, and they're going to take him off and torture him, and they are going to run him through some illegal trials, and then they're going to crucify him. This is what Paul is describing in Philippians 2.6. Although he existed in the form of God, although he had every right to assert his authority, and he gives them a glimpse of it, just to let them know, if I wanted to, you'd all be dead. But he doesn't think he should assert his rights, even though he has every authority to do so. 
So he's not going to hold on to it, and he is going to submit himself. He is going to be, be obedient by submitting himself to the point of death. Well, when this happens, of course we know that of any of the disciples are going to react, it's going to be Peter. Peter is the one who many of us identify with first and foremost. He acts first and thinks later. And he is going to react. And this is described in all four Gospels, as I stated earlier. And what we read here that is described in Matthew is this. Suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, that is to Peter, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Now there's some interesting things here that we have to point out in, orderly, in order to properly understand and interpret this passage. Jesus' comment is one that has brought about a lot of misuse and misinterpretation, especially by pacifists. It's the idea that they want to interpret that, that if you use weapons, if you're in the military, if you uh, are, use your weapons in self-defense, then you will die in such a manner. And that ignores so much of the context and the teaching of Scripture. The sword that is mentioned here in both verses, the Greek word makaira, which refers to a sword like the one in front of the pulpit. This is a Roman gladius, translated into Greek as a makaira. It's a double-edged, sharp sword. The reason we have tape along the edge of this makaira is because you could shave with it. And that is how it was uh, given to those of us who are pastors at the 200th anniversary of Preston City Bible Church uh, a couple of years ago. And so Peter's Makaira would have been that sharp. It just sliced off Malchus's ear. We'll come back to that in a second. Now, why did they have these swords? Why, where did that come from? Well, Luke tells us about this. In Luke twenty-two thirty-six. Jesus had authorized them to bring swords. And it stated in Matthew 22, I mean Luke 22, 36, then he said to them, this is as they're leaving from the upper room after the Seder meal, says, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. See, when Jesus has sent the disciples out to the uh, house of Judah and the house of Israel earlier, back in Matthew 10, he told them not to take money with them, not to take a knapsack, not to take a weapon, but to just go to the house of, of Israel and the house of Judah and to let those to whom he was going provide the logistics for them. But now he gives them a different order. It's going to be a different dispensation. There are different uh, rules at play. He says, he who has a money bag, let him take it. Support yourself as you go along the way. Likewise, a knapsack, take food with you. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Protect yourself along the way. This is a foundation for the biblical teaching of self-defense, that we are authorized to defend ourselves from criminal action. And so they had uh, concealed weapons, and they were to take them with them. And Jesus authorized that. And so as he asked them that, they said, or two of them said, Lord, look, here are two swords. So two of them are armed. Peter was one of them, and uh, there was also uh, another one that was armed, but we do not know who it was. And Jesus' reply was, it's enough. And so this is why they were armed and why Peter was armed. He was armed for two reasons. He was armed in order to provide for self-defense. Jesus did not want to be attacked in a way that would not allow him to reach his goal of the cross. And so that was one reason that they had um, these weapons was for self-defense. And now that the arrest was taking place, it, he's going to point out it's not the time to use them. So this is what is taking going on. Verse 49, we read, um, 
that the disciples, it's not mentioned in Matthew, but before Peter strikes out, a couple of the other disciples said to the Lord, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? He's authorized them to bring swords. The soldiers and the priests and the religious leaders come. They're about to uh, uh, arrest Jesus. And so they want to know, Lord, is this the time that we use the swords? And Peter, before he gets an answer, pulls his sword and tries to cleave the head of the servant of the high priest. And now some people say, well, Peter wasn't a trained soldier, so he missed. Well, could be that Malchus had quick reactions and he dodged, and so Peter just got the edge of him and took off his ear. So we don't know which it was, but the ear is lying on the ground, the blood is flowing. All of you know that anybody who has even the most minor of head wounds just bleeds profusely. And so it is an extremely dramatic uh, situation. Before we get to that, I want to go back to talk about what Jesus meant when he said, when he said those who uh, live by the sword will die by the sword. This is not a statement of pacifism. We have to understand the idiom that's going on here. And what Jesus is talking about is if you are seeking to solve your problems through the illegitimate use of weapons, then you will be taken care of by the legitimate power of the state. This is how this phrase, the sword, this idiom of using the sword uh, is seen in Romans 13.4 when Paul is talking about the authority of the state to take life. He says, for he that is the ruler is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, that is trying to solve your problem through violence, illegally. If you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Remember in the Garden of Eden, when after Adam and Eve had sinned and God uh, pointed out to them the consequences of that sin in terms of pain and sorrow and childbirth and working and gaining food by the sweat of your brow, he then casts Uh, Adam and Eve out of the garden and he sets a guard around the garden a guard made up of numerous cherubs and they are bearing a flaming sword in other words God's going to execute them through the sword if they if anyone attempts to get to the tree of life so this idea of bearing the sword implies a legitimate use of power to take life and so that's what Jesus is talking about here if you live by the sword if you're trying to solve your problems illegitimately uh, through the use of violence then uh, you risk the government taking your life so that's what he's pointing out to and so what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew 26 52 as he's addressing Peter is that no matter how wicked or unjust his arrest might be Peter had no right to take vigilante action. A right thing done in a wrong way was wrong. He is, uh, in this whole statement, he's emphasizing that it is legitimate to defend yourselves, and he could have defended himself, verse 53, by calling upon the angels. But there was a higher, more significant purpose at play here, and so it was not the time to engage in self-defense. He was going to go to an illegal trial, and he would lose his life, but that was the Father's plan. So back to Matthew chapter 26, looking at verse, uh, verse 54. At the conclusion of this statement, he begins it, Verse 52, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. The next thing he says in verse 53, do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? And then 30 says, how then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? This is the third point we're looking at. Prophecy must be fulfilled. 
And this is stated in these two passages, Matthew 26, 54, it's stated overtly, and John 18, 9, it's alluded to. So I want to look at these two passages. He says, how then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, then it goes on to read, in that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me. He's indicating that they're coming out in an illegitimate manner. And then verse 56 reiterates the uh, statement about the fulfillment of prophecy. He says, but all these things, all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. John talks about the fact that he uh, addressed the Romans and said, let these go. In John 18, verse 9, we read that this, that this was done that the saying might be fulfilled of which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Now, what's interesting, and the reason I put John 17, 12 up, is just the chapter before in his high priestly prayer, Jesus prayed to the Father, and he said, those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition. That's Judas. The word for perdition, perdition is the same word that is used in John uh, 3.16 for perishing, indicate, indicating that he was lost uh, and not saved, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Again and again, especially as we get into this section with the trial, the arrest, the trial, and the crucifixion and resurrection, we're going to see numerous prophecies from the Old Testament fulfilled. And this is designed to give us great confidence that the scriptures are the word of God, that God was in control of this whole series of events, and that uh, the scripture is true and the word of God. So let's look at four of these prophecies that were fulfilled, or five of these prophecies that are fulfilled. First of all, He's betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. The prophecy comes from Zechariah 11:12. Several of these prophecies come out of Zechariah, that is, those who are fulfilled at this time. Zechariah 11:12. Then I said to them, if it is, this is the prophet speaking, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. The context is a messianic prophecy, and it's fulfilled. Matthew 26, uh, 14 and 15, one of the 12, Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. That was the price according to the law of a slave. It's the treating him as if his life has almost no value whatsoever. The second prophecy that is fulfilled here is what happens to that 30 pieces of silver. In Zechariah 11:13, the next verse from the one we just went to, the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took, there's a little humor there, so I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Now, what is this thing about the potter? Well, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah is given uh, orders by God to go to a potter and to get some pottery and he is going to take it out of the potsherd gate the, on the southern part of the wall of Jerusalem, and he's going to take it to the valley of Hinnom where he is going to crush it. The valley of Hinnom was where the, uh, those in Judah practiced child sacrifice, where they offered their babies and their infants to the god Moloch, where they burned them alive in the arms of Moloch. 
This abomination was one of the primary reasons that God was bringing the Babylonians to Judah to destroy them. We studied this in in Matthew a couple of times on the significance of the word uh, Gehenna. And so this was the site of the worst sins committed by the Jews in the southern kingdom. And so when when Jeremiah takes this, he's giving an object lef- lesson. He's crushing the pottery, which represents Israel. And God is saying, I'm going to crush you, and you are going to be buried here in the uh, Valley of Hinnom. And so it came to be known as the, as the, the related to the potter, this field uh, that would be... Um, that would become a cemetery for the poor. So that's the, why it's called for the potter. It, it picked up that name because of Jeremiah. And so it's fulfilled that after Jesus is crucified, Judas is overwhelmed with guilt. And in Matthew 27, 5, we're told that he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. So he takes the bag of silver, throws it into the temple, and leaves. That's a fulfillment of prophecy. Also in this verse, we see that it's thrown to the potter. Zechariah 11.13 emphasizes that part, throw it to the potter. And so he threw it into the house of the Lord for the potter. And we're told that when this money was discovered, because it was tainted money, because it had been used to bribe someone to give an, un, uh, an illegal testimony, a false testimony against Jesus. It couldn't be used for anything in the temple. So it had to be taken away from the temple, and according to uh, Jewish law, the only thing it could be used for is something that would benefit the poor. So they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field. This is located in the Valley of Hinnom and would be a burial place for the poor or for Gentiles who were traveling through Israel who had no family. This is where uh, the state would bury them. So that is our uh, third a fulfillment of prophecy. In Acts 1, a couple of times in Acts 1 11 and in Acts 1 18 and 19, there's because the disciples are going to replace Judas, there's a couple of things said about him. And in verse 18, it says, Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity. Now, when that money is thrown into the temple, it's still Judas. The, the Sanhedrin can't accept it because it's tainted money. So it's still considered Judas's money. So Judas is the one who bought the field in their thinking. So this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. Now, he hung himself, and then the way this is brought together, he hung himself, and the branch broke, and then he lands, or, or after his body is decomposed or whatever, when it falls off the tree, this is what causes uh, his bowels to burst open. And so it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, Akaldama, which means the field of blood. The image that I have there is an image of Judas hanging from a tree. It is a painting in the monastery of Onesiphorus, which is located there in the valley of Hinnom. And so this is where the by the field of Akaldama. Fourth prophecy is that Jesus would be betrayed by a friend. This is specifically stated in John 13, 18 to 19, quoting from Psalm 41, 9. Psalm 41, 9 says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And this is a messianic prophecy that is stated in John 13, Uh, 18 to be fulfilled, where Jesus, after identifying Judas, says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. In Acts 1.16, Peter, in his uh, sermon on the day of Pentecost, says, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled 
which the Holy Spirit spoke before the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. So the scripture clearly interprets scripture as being a messianic prophecy. And then the fifth prophecy that's fulfilled in this event is a prophecy that Jesus would be deserted by his disciples. And in Zechariah 13, 7 says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, that is a reference to the Messiah, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. That would be God the Father. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. And in Matthew 26, 31, we read Jesus saying, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But it was not only the 11 that are scattered, but Mark records an, sort of an addendum to this episode that is kind of interesting. And a lot, because Mark's the only one who includes this detail, and he seems to be the only one who knows this detail, a lot of people uh, think that this was probably Mark himself. And so at Mark we read that when all the disciples, the 11, fled, there was a young man who was following Jesus. So this guy's a he's lurking in the shadows. He's a disciple wannabe. And, but for some reason, the only thing he has on is a linen cloth on his body, just a linen robe. And we're told that when, um, when he was identified, that uh, the young men grabbed him, and he just slipped out of his robe and ran off naked. All of Jesus, even the wannabes, are fleeing from Jesus. He is being left alone. And that is the emphasis in the text. And so, verse 57 goes on, And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But John puts it a little more precisely. He says, The detachment of troops, the cohort, and the captain, and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus, and they bound him, which is uh, not mentioned in verse 57. So they tie him up, and then they lead him off to these trials. Again, Jesus submits. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus had a higher purpose. He could have exercised his rights, but he did not. That's true humility. And he fulfilled the Father's plan to go to the cross and pay the penalty for our sins and to suffer all of the humiliation that that brought. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to once again go through the details of our Lord's arrest, understanding the many laws were broken that night, that this was illegal and it was uh, totally unjustified, but that he was arrested for a purpose, that you allowed this in your plan in order to bring him to the cross where he could die in our place as our substitute for our sins. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here this morning or anyone listening online, that if they have never trusted Christ as Savior, this is your opportunity to do so. Jesus died for everyone. He died for the sins of the world. The certificate of the debt against us was wiped out, but we are still spiritually dead. The issue is not our sin or how bad we've been. The issue is how great our Lord is and what he has done to save us. He has paid the price in full, he said, to tell us die. Paid in full. All we have to do is accept that payment for our sins. When we trust in him and him alone, we have eternal life. Father, we pray, too, that we might be encouraged and strengthened seeing how prophecy is fulfilled, that in just this little episode, there are five prophecies made from as far back as a thousand years that are fulfilled specifically and precisely at the arrest of Jesus. And this confirms for us the truth, the veracity of your word, 
that we can trust it totally because not only were five prophecies fulfilled, but well over a hundred were fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus. And all of the rest will be fulfilled when he returns in the future. Now, Father, I pray that you would challenge us with these things in Christ's name. Amen.